How's everybody doing? Are we having fun here at the Long Beach Comic Con? Yeah. Getting out of the rain? Who needs San Diego? You got this so much closer, it's easier. No lines. Um, my name is Andre Salazar. I'm very excited to talk to you guys today about comic books, comic art specifically. Um, so this is a treat. This is the largest group I've ever gotten to speak to in a public setting. So uh, we do. We are pressed for time. I made this slide deck. It is probably longer than what we have time for. We're just going to bust through it, and if we, you know, run out of time, then that's the way it is. Uh, what we will not do is we're not going to have question and answer at the end. We'll just do it here live, okay? So if you have a comment or a question about something, let's just like bang it out as we go, and we'll just see how far we go. Um, the objective of this is to look at the masters of comic book art, and really look at them through the prism of the elements of art and the principles of design. Those of you who've been to art school or studied a little bit of art, these are kind of the elements, the things that we consider art. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to go through what I consider are some of the best comic book artists, but it's not exhaustive at all. In fact, I got like 40 or so artists here, and there's like so many more that I did not put. So it's not exhaustive. I'm just going to throw out some people that I think you should know, and if you're a fan of the medium, to like study. But um, yeah, don't be mad if your favorite guy's not on here, because there's just too many guys here. Uh, about me, who am I? So I make comics. I make uh, children's books. I've done some anthologies, things like that, writer of Prime Missouri. Uh, I have stuff on Webtoons. I'm the creator of the Art of Comics channel. So the Art of Comics YouTube channel, um, I do a lot of long form interviews with artists. I review books. I talk about art. I talk about the medium and the business. So that's my plug for the YouTube channel. And actually, we're recording it for the channel. So in theory, we'll edit this and make it fancy. And hopefully, it sounds OK. And then we'll put it up there as well. Uh, I have a Patreon, which has all of my creative work there. So I eat, sleep, breathe comic books. So let's, let's do some quotes real quick. Um, Harvey P. Carr says, comics are words and pictures. You can do anything with words and pictures. Alan Moore said, I try to do things in comics that cannot be repeated by television, by movies, by entertainment. And third, Chris Ware, the real power of comics is writing as you draw. I thought this was kind of these kind of interesting little quotes about the power of comics, how they interact with one's mind, and uh, how you create them. So, whoa, what just happened? Oh no, hang on one second. That was a, that was a little faux pas on my mouse. Hang on, apologies. Okay. Okay. Um, so what is a comic? Let's just talk about what a comic is. There's three here. Which one of these is not a comic? So you've got that, you've got that, you've got that. So the answer, of course, is A. So this is an advertisement. Now, it's using the lexicon, the format of comic books. Um, you know, it's using word balloons. It's using the kind of artwork that we think of as comics. But for the sake of this presentation, we're going to say that comics are a combination of words and images to tell a story. So specifically, it's to tell a story. So you can have a story that is single panel, like the far side. You can have a story that is silent, that doesn't have words. But there's got to be that element of storytelling. To me, that is what a comic is as far as this presentation goes. So A, you're just selling books or selling uh, certificates. So that's not, that's not a comic. Um, so sequential art is that combination of words and pictures. Um, and when we talk about comics, I'm going to use that term globally, but we're including manga, uh, bande, fumetti, all these different like worlds and cultures that use comics in their storytelling. So, but I'm just going to call it comics because a, a manga is a comic. It's just another word for it. Um, so here's the question is Basquiat comics, okay? Now, Basquiat's one of my favorite artists of all time. It's words, it's pictures. You could say that there's a story in here, perhaps, 
but is it comics? That's up to you. I'm not going to say. But I think this is a borderline. This is like where we get kind of murky ground where perhaps Basquiat is. Um, I don't know. But what about Roy Lichtenstein? So if you look at Roy Lichtenstein's work, he is using definitely comics. I mean, he uses Russ Heath comics and DC comics. He used uh, these older comics. But what he did, what his magic was, use these art pieces to then kind of explore some kind of societal or social question. And the reproduction of them in these large, big formats is really where kind of the, the craftsmanship of the art takes place. If you haven't seen any Lichtenstein's work, uh, if you're ever down in downtown LA at the Broad, go to the Broad Museum. There's some wonderful Lichtenstein pieces there. Um, you can kind of see them. And when you see them in, in life, you can kind of understand, okay, I can see why this is considered art. There are those, though, of course, that consider it just plagiarism and that he, you know, he made $4 million off some artwork and Russ Heath made nothing out of it. So you kind of think about that kind of element. So uh, for the, again, for the sake of this conversation, perhaps this is not a comic. So how do comics work? Um, when we talk about, we use this term a lot called storytelling. And really what we're talking about is the page and panel composition and how your eye moves through the page or panel. Uh, in manga, in Japanese, it's a different direction. So from American or English or European, Western comics, it goes from left to right, top to bottom. In Japanese culture, in Asian cultures, it goes from right to left, not left to right. So there's, there's an element of storytelling in kind of how the pages are composed. Also pacing. Pacing is another, another element. We'll talk about pacing in a moment and how that determines the speed in which one reads the comic, goes over the material. And then there's the gutter. The gutter is where um, the magic happens. The gutter is where, and there's, a great, there's some great images in Understanding Comics we're going to share here about how uh, it's between the comics is where, where your mind does all the, the fun stuff. So if we look at pacing for a moment, um, pacing slows down time, showing this first, so there's two pages here, these are classics, They're, they both came out very similarly around the same time in the mid 80s. One is from uh, Watchmen and the one on the uh, right is from The Dark Knight by Frank Miller. And the Watchmen, we see Rorschach, right? And we see him, but we're seeing this one movement through these different perception, these uh, perspectives. So the camera is placed in different spots and different angles to kind of show what he's doing, right? Now you could have shown this, this action in two panels or three panels, but he uses nine, right? To really give us the evoke, to evoke that, um, that area, that sense of time and place and what is happening. You know, very, very noir kind of feeling. And in, a lot, and in um, Dark Knight, you see in here, this is slowing down time. Have you guys, you hear this expression where you get into a car wreck or something immediate happens and you feel like time is slowing down and something you know very traumatic is happening? It's like that, where here in the moment when Thomas uh, and Martha Wayne are shot, um, we see the time slowing down, the panels, are zooming in, they're zooming out, we see kind of repetition of panel, and that kind of like shows us how time's slowing down to really, uh, for lack of a better word, savor that moment and take more time with that moment to give it more emotional impact. Ultimately, that's what you're trying to do in a comic, right? Is storytelling, which is get the emotions of somebody. Another thing about uh, repeating panels, you can repeat panels to show comedy, right, or to show thinking. In Invincible, you see here where uh, there's that repeat panel there on panel uh, four and five and six. You see there's this moment, it's kind of a comedic moment, right, where he's like thinking, more thinking, time has passed, then time has passed, he gets a question, and then again. So it, you're using it for kind of a timing comedy beat. 
in the other panel by uh, Pluto, the manga, in that one, you have this zoom in, where on the first panel and the fourth panel, the face is zoomed in a little bit, and that is kind of perhaps showing some thinking or meditation or, or even other emotions that might happen. So you'll have panels like, we'll repeat and zoom in to kind of give another like thought. Here talking about the page composition in gutter, uh, this first panel we see, now you die, no, no, yeah. Now, we don't really know what happens, right? We're going to assume some things happen by the art and just our own uh, subjectiveness, but yeah, so that, whatever is happening here, him getting chopped up or whatever, we don't really know, but we assume that's happening and that's kind of like, where the artist and writer are really kind of putting their thoughts is what is happening in between those panels and how do we best um, relate that. Another way, cool way to show composition too in panels is you have one image that's in broken up. So this one image of this um, road that these two people are having this conversation with, it's broken up into nine panels. And this is a great way to then show basically time and conversation go through as they walk down this like, you know, the Great Wall of China or whatever this is. We see this a lot of times too in comics, which is kind of fun. And then the last one, now using, using kind of dynamic action moments, you can then really play with where the panels are and how they kind of uh, are dynamically placed in these diagonals and things like that. So you can just bust up the whole like paradigm by throwing some action in there. We good? Keep going? Questions, comments? Pretty good, right? Well, you understand. Okay, now, we're going to talk about Wallace Wood uh, later, but let me just say this. If any, are any of you guys make comics or thinking about making comics? Yeah, so you know, if you don't have this, I'm sure you do. Uh, if you're interested in making comics at all, and I can give this, I give you a copy of this too online, or I can give it to you later today. Um, 22 panels that always work. This was created actually, uh, this was stitched together by, I think it was Larry Hama, who was an assistant of his. But this is a brilliant, this is like the Bible. This is such a wonderful way to think about making panels interesting in comics. And this is just tw 22 different ways to stage a scene or stage a moment in comics. So I love this, I have this printed up, I look at it all the time. When I get stumped on, on how something should go, I think about this and I'm like, oh, maybe I should just do a silhouette or maybe I should do big head or maybe I should do this or that and the other. Um, this is a brilliant tool and it just goes to show how wonderful Wallace Wood was because he is considered one of the best. Okay, so what is art? You know, uh, philosophical debate, right? Can we even define art? Uh, do you know it when you see it? That's kind of a comment when they, you know, a court case years ago. So the question is, what is art? I, I, I don't know. But we do have some parameters we can use. And to, that's what today is going to be about. We're going to look at comic book art through these elements. There's the seven essential elements of art. Line, texture, tone, shapes, color, form, and space. When you look at comics, and today when we look at them, you'll see perhaps a couple of these really being emphasized. Rarely will you see all seven used perfectly in a panel or in a page, you know. Basically, we kind of like look at these certain elements of art to find beauty, symmetry, those kind of things. In fact, that leads me to the principles of design, which are how those elements are put together, right? and what is considered, say, beautiful or interesting. So there's balance, contrast. Contrast is very important, of course, in black and white comics. Emphasis, using color. Remember in that comic, uh, Frank Miller's Sin City, uh, That Yellow Bastard, he used yellow, right? And in other ones, he'll use red. And those colors, those emphasize and just impacts you and you feel like, okay, that something is happening here in this moment. There's movement, we have a lot of that in comics, rhythm, hierarchy, white space, and unity. So let's now just talk about some comics, go through these guys, and um, see what we think. Here we go. These are in no particular order. It's just what I think is cool, okay? 
Don't come at me because somebody's not here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's. Do you guys know Windsor McKay? Have you guys heard of Windsor McKay at all? Some of you? Yeah. Um, this Windsor McKay, and, and particularly Little Nemo, Adventures in Slumberland, I think the title is. Um, if you haven't seen this, go find some of this online, or if you can, get a book or two of it. This was done over a hundred years ago, and it is still, in my opinion, some of the best comics made. From a, a draftsmanship level, the way he's able to use line, and you'll see these lines, especially on the, the black and white images, it's just really, really freaking good. Now he used, he did big, he worked in really, really big pages. So the art was really big. Uh, but the detail, look at the detail and the coloring. And he was, uh, he was also animation. He did a lot of different things, but find um, Little Nemo, I feel, is brilliant. And it's a great piece to study, to look at uh, the detail. Uh, look at the boat and see how the boat is crafted on the underside of that. And there's all these little things that he's doing with these, with the technology of 100 years ago. I mean, he's not using fancy rotaring rapidographs. You know, he's not using all the fancy cool stuff that we have. He's on paper doing this stuff. It's, it's brilliant work. We talked about Wallace Wood a moment. Uh, we'll mention him again. Um, one of the best draftsmen in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, known as a curmudgeon and definitely had some demons, but as far as like art, it's brilliant. If you just look at this page here, you really get a sense of that contrast, right? We talk about contrast. He's using texture on the rock and on the uh, tree there. You really get a, a beautiful sense of the, the molding and the, the three-dimensionality of the figure there in half shadow and silhouette there. Brilliant work. Um, he did another, another book that you can find on Fanographics called Canon. Highly recommend Canon. This was more of a daily strip that he did. And if you look at these panels, especially on the, the, bottom, the bottom one, you can see those types of panels that we talked about before, right? He's using the big silhouette. He's using the overhead isometric. He's using big head over shoulder. So he's using all those kind of different ways to create variety and interest on a page. So uh, another guy to really look at. And he's using tone. He'll use zipatone there, you'll see, uh, and some great contrast. So love Wallywood. Noel Sickles. Noel Sickles might be a guy you may or may not know. He was more of an illustrator, but he did work with Milton Kniff on some work. He is another brilliant guy. If you, when we talk about Alex Toth, he kind of connects to Alex Toth a little bit. I think Alex Toth looked to Noel uh, for some inspiration and work. But again, if you just look at some of the cool drop shadows he's putting on these figures and the way he's doing the lighting, it is really, really well done. It's brilliant. And here on the second page of it, you'll see at the top a looseness to it. When you've seen some of his illustrations he does for, uh, he did like stuff for like uh, Saturday Evening Post and Look and those kind of magazines. Just really fun, loose, kind of a gestural element to it. You'll see that in the hands and the faces. And it's just kind of a, almost kind of a Bilson Kevich, you know, if you think about his work. It's got a little bit of that loose gestural element to it. Noel Sickles is, Amazing, and he's a great painter too. I'm not putting their uh, illustration work. I'm just focusing on a comic book specifically. But a lot of these guys were illustrators, and they did like the book like that. Speaking of illustrators, we've got Frank Frazetta. So most of us know Frank Frazetta, Conan, Death Dealer, all those kind of big, uh, you know, paperback books stuff. Um, but did you know he did comics? And he did amazing comics. Um, he probably left comics, if I recall, probably for the money, and he went to where the real money was, was illustration and did film stuff, film posters. If you look at these pages, though, and look at his brushwork, it really is phenomenal. Uh, the way he's able to just, again, I'm going to use that term draftsman. The faces, especially on these soldiers here, are just really, really, really impressive. I really like the way the chiaroscuro kind of face there is half in shadow. The, the, the detail, and he's using these like probably Windsor Newton Series 7s, zeros and ones and twos to kind of like feather out that, that detail and uh, create a tone in that. 
in that uh, image to give it kind of a more of a depth and three-dimensional work. Uh, he was just a master of drawing of all types, so highly recommend looking at Frazetta's, some of his comic work. Now, Frazetta is realistic, you know, draftsman, rendering. Now we look at Chris Ware, who is really combining words and images together to create something, right? He, his work to me is very emotional. There's wonderful work that he's done. Look the way he draws. He simplifies everything down into these core elements. And he's adding, you can see he's putting the words in the image. He's really creating the image um, and the words together for this one kind of unit. And I love the cutaway stuff. I love the, the, the design of this page and just the, the uh, density of information that's in here. Um, I met him at Comic-Con a couple years ago and just amazing, amazing uh, creator. One of my top three, like full stop. Here's some more work of his. Looking at page composition, you can really see how he's slowing down time for us to really focus on these little elements, right? She puts the bread in the, in the toaster oven. You know, we take a moment for that. We take a moment for her to put it down. All these things slow us down to kind of like get a sense of her, the malaise of life for her, right, as a mother and walking through the garden, all these little things. And notice it's all broken up into squares. It's all kind of like a mathematical equation. And they, he breaks up them even to smaller squares, right? To even create some more little moments. I love that stuff. It's just, I can't even think about how you plan that out, but it's just really, really great. The other panel is, is neat too, because now we're using circles as kind of the panels and that's kind of rare and the way he's able to show time. This is really like the life of a person from birth to death. And he's able to do this in what, uh, 16 panels. Um, I mean, if I were to say, hey, okay, go make a comic about a person's life in 16 panels, how would you do, like, what do you do? What are those things? And, and the, the way he's able to do that is just marvelous. So highly recommend checking out his stuff. Robert Crumb, I felt like I had to put Robert Crumb in here. Um, I'm not the biggest Robert Crumb fan, but he definitely influenced a generation and his work in Zap Comics and things like that in San Francisco were, was very innovative at the time and influenced a lot of people. So uh, again, just look at the depth of, of line work, right? This is And this is line work that's creating texture and it's creating tones because all the values in here are done by, you know, marking. These are the markings he's making. And it's just a lot, I just, when I look at this page, I think of the work. I'm like, man, this must have took so long to just sit here and make all those marks and letter all that by hand. And the letters are going behind the woman and they're going in front of each other. And there's just so much talking and things going on in there. Um, it's brilliant work. His stuff is uh, not for the faint of heart. It's not family friendly but uh, it's very impactful, I'll say. Now you might say, why am I putting Yonan Vasquez in here? That's kind of not, you would think, a comic master. Well, I'm putting Yonan Vasquez because one, if you went to Hot Topic in like the early, late 90s, 2000s, it was run by his work. I mean, Johnny Homicidal Maniac, Invader Zim, all that stuff like was the engine that kept those businesses alive. And there's a reason. It was because it was so innovative at the time. If you look at what he's doing here with the panel borders alone and the hidden words in there and all that stuff and the, the, the dynamic kind of visceral uh, anger and emotion and, and uh, violence, we didn't see that. We didn't see that before. When slave labor graphics probably saw that, I can, I can only imagine what they thought when they first saw this, but it definitely influenced a lot of work. It was influential and important. And um, if you've never seen the Invader Zim cartoon, highly recommend it. It's very good. So got somebody who um, definitely uh, tapped the water and ripples of his work in the industry. We put him in there. Ashley Wood. Um, I'm a big fan. This is one of my just like favorites. I love Ashley Wood's work. 
Um, there's, again, a very energetic uh, style. It's gestural. It's, it's kind of kinetic. I love the, the organic kind of quick. It looks like he did this in like 10 minutes. He just like sketches it out really quick. But the use of color, the use of tone in the second panel, all these different types of deleter screens he's using. He's not using one deleter screen. There's like three or four different kinds. And there's hints of color, right? Just that little dot of red by the temple is the emphasis, right? It's a moment where like, oh, what is that? And your eye goes to it. And you want to look at that. And then you kind of look at and then your eye goes down where it says she denied. And you look at that. And then you go back around over to where there's another little dialogue bubble. And so just the way he's able to compose these pages and create texture and tone with these things uh, to me is just really cool. I like, I like him a lot, big fan. Uh, if we keep going, we talk about Kent Williams. Kent Williams is one of these like fine art, one foot in the fine art world, one far foot in the kind of illustration comics world. Um, he does wonderful paintings. This, these pages are from a book called Meltdown, which he did for Epic Comics, which was a um, Wolverine and Havoc story. When I got these at the comic shop, when they first came out, I was blown away. I had no idea you could paint comics. I had no idea comics could look like this. Like there's no panel borders. It's white. It, there's no, it's all just so different and so kinetic. Um, I really was jazzed about this because it felt like this was fine art in a way. Um, here's another panel another page. This is just really neat to kind of see how in here there's no gutter, right? So he takes out the gutter. Now, maybe that is an aesthetic choice. He just didn't want to have those white bars, but maybe that also shows a quickness of time. And this is happening like bang, bang, bang. This is, there's no spaces. This is the moments. Um, so yeah, huge fan of him. Just brilliant watercolor with some acrylics, looks like in gouaches and, and little sprays of toothbrush and stuff like that. Love it. You guys all know Alex Ross. I mean, I would be surprised if someone doesn't. He's a, you know, this is a heavily photo referenced illustrator who does comics very well because of that photorealistic look. Um, if you ever get a chance to see his originals and, you know, he does in watercolor and gouache, you will see the beautiful airbrushing, all the cool details that he's putting on there and a, a great sense of lighting. Here you can see this lighting and camera placement. So as he's doing these photography, some of his books, when you'll get a book, he'll do like some, he'll show like some of the, the photo referenced work he does to prepare for it. Some of that, that's really where the magic is happening. I mean, he's a draftsman, he can render this stuff. But his ability to think about what is most dynamic and how to pose the, the figure and light it properly is, is really where the magic is for him. Um, great stuff. Highly recommend. If you haven't read Alex Ro Ross, I would say read um, Kingdom Come, I think, is the gateway for him. Okay. And then now we're going to talk about Alex Toth. We could talk about him for an hour. Another top five. Alex Toth. Um, I don't even know what I could say that would add to the conversation. He's just a master of, of design, of figure. Please go get an Alex Toth book if you haven't read any of his stuff. You can even get like Zorro, some of that stuff. It's wonderful. He, he, did, he did some work for Hanna-Barbera as well, some animation, model design stuff. But let's just look at this page, the, the Hot Wheels page. So. You could spend days studying this page and think about all the different elements that he's putting in here. The dynamic movements, the curves, the organic lines of the curves, um, the tones he's using, the ways he's incorporating the sound effects into the art, right? And, and how that is moving your eye through, it really is brilliant. And each panel has a different type of camera, right? One is a silhouette, one is going this way, one is isometric, one is going front on, one is a close up, and it's so dynamic. It really is a master of comics. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of Alex Toth. So. You guys good? Okay.
If you guys have anything, just raise your hand or shout it out. Say, I think you're full of. Okay, Paul Pope. Do you guys know Paul Pope a little bit? Don't know Paul Pope. Um, highly recommend, I would say start with like heavy liquid or something like that. Paul Pope is another one of these um, very organic brush line work. He uses um, wonderful, beautiful brush work on these figures. It's a very, very unique style. Um, and he uses tones and colors. You'll see he, he likes to use these kind of muted tones and values to kind of uh, saturate the story and kind of the elements. But uh, I'm a big fan of, of Paul Pope. He doesn't do nearly as much as I would love to see him do, um, but a uh, huge fan of Paul Pope. We can't be at a Comic-Con without talking about uh, Rest in Peace, Neil Adams. What a, what a consummate artist. He did so much. So many people have emulated him, have kind of like used him as a reference point and then went off, uh, you know, started doing illustrative marketing, uh, advertised work, used those skills into creating comics. And just to look at these faces and the different ways he's um, drawing faces is really impressive and how he's using both page and panel compositions, but also emotion and shadows and things like that. Just real brilliant work. Richard Corbin, another one of my favorites. Uh, his, he, his work is, um, he's got a really interesting process that we don't have time to go into, but the way he creates his comics and the way he paints them is very kind of interesting and out there. It's really cool. Um, you could say there's like, there's some photorealistic qualities and elements to it, uh, the way like, for instance, the muscles are done, but also there's a simplification uh, and almost cartoon-like elements too. So he's really combining this photorealistic muscles with a cartoon simplified things. And his sense of color, which these panels do not really represent how good his color is, but his color is so good, the way he's using the color wheel, complementary colors, tertiary colors, all these different things to create, evoke emotion. Uh, Richard Corbin just passed away too a couple years ago, but brilliant, brilliant work with this stuff. Din is the book that everyone refers to. That was in heavy metal back in the late 70s. Um, again, not for, not family friendly, but just amazing artwork. We're gonna move to some uh, manga here. Junji Ito. Uh, I got to see him at Comic-Con. He was at Comic-Con a couple months ago. Uh, probably the, the, the biggest comic book artist on the planet, I would say, maybe, as far as, like, books sold. He sell. I mean, his books, there's a million of them, and he sells them everywhere in, like, every language. Uh, yeah, he, he sells more than, you know, Jim Lee or somebody else. He, it's phenomenal to think about how massive of a star he is and it's just because he's he's a great renderer he has great ability to like uh, capture the human form but his body morphing horror stuff is just scary it's just creepy as all crud and his stories are just the scariest freaking stuff I've ever seen. If you don't like body horror, don't don't go down this hole. But if you like weird, creepy stuff, dude, you could not get anybody creepier than Junji Ito. Um, yeah, amazing. Miyazaki. So a lot of you guys know Miyazaki from like Spirited Away, Princess Monoke, um, uh, Ponyo. There's a new one that's coming out. I can't remember his name. This work though he did in between animations called Nausicaa. I think it's called the Valley of Nausicaa or Nausicaa. Of the Valley of Nausicaa. Thank you. Um, top, top five of all comics. I mean if you look at the work that he's doing in this book and I think Viz came out with this big two book set in a little clamshell or a slipcase. Um, it is amazing. All organic all with line work showing this really cool three-dimensionality of things and I mean if you look at it a moment you're kind of you don't understand what's going on but then when you take a moment to like see it and see what he's doing it is incredible there's no straight lines 
There's no rulers. It's just him creating things and, and using just his ability to just create things and be imaginative is phenomenal. So highly, highly recommend Nausicaa and Miyazaki stuff. It's, he's a master, no doubt. When you talk about Japanese masters, you've got to talk about Otomo. You've got to talk about Akira. So if you've not seen, I'm sure most of you have seen the anime uh, Akira. Akira is amazing. It was a manga. The manga is brilliant. It's massive. It's like, the, the anime is like just a fraction of what's really going on in that story. And uh, here's a guy which, in a way, is the reverse of Miyazaki because he is really going for more realistic things. He's putting things in the real world. He's, he's um, putting on the bolts and the car and the design and all these things as though you can like build this like a, like a blueprint. Uh, but yet he's still able to show emotion because at the end of the day, again, storytelling is emotion. And you can see in that face at the bottom there, you know, there's an emotion there and there's an ability to draft the face. So um, as far as like just action, great comics made in Japan, you can't go wrong with Otomo. Okay, Jack Kirby, I have to put him here. He deserves it. Uh, He's kind of like the grandfather of comics because it's like everything in modern co in modern superhero comics comes from Jack Kirby, I feel like. So many elements of how to lay out the page, how to position figures, the Kerbal Crackle, all these little things that he kind of invented a lot of these things that in superhero comics, at least, we use, right? And so uh, enough cannot be said about his ability to create stuff. Was he a draftsman? Well, no. Was he trying to like create a, a you know a three-dimensional realistic picture of something? No, he wasn't. He was making exciting, dynamic images, and that's that's his bread and butter, and that's what he did. Bill Sienkiewicz, top three. I love freaking Bill Sienkiewicz. His ability to combine different elements on the same page where he's doing a kind of a gestural drawing he does a full-on rendering painting he does you know he's pulling from like bob peak these illustrators he's pulling all these different effects with airbrush and spray cans and paints and pencils and he really does wonderful mixed media work and really shows you can see on these panels all these cool effects and things he's doing to to tell a story. Look his sense of color, you know? The police officers coming through that door and all red, right? That moment of heightened uh, emotion and excitement. Um, the, the silhouettes of the, like, what is it, like a white, white fur coat or something like that, and the, and the, the black, blackness melting away into the background of the officers next to them. And there's just so many fun things that he's doing here. Um, I love Bill Sienkiewicz, I do. Frank Miller, um, what can be, I mean, we all know Frank Miller. He's evolved so much through his career. When this first panel here, you look at Daredevil and what he's doing there, almost like a Neil, Neil Adams kind of like look to it or a John Byrne look. And then when he goes to Dark Knight Returns, totally different style. Now he's really simplifying things, getting it more, uh, I guess you could say cartoony, but kind of basic in some ways, but also heightened emotion and using a lot of silhouettes. And then when you go to Sin City, you really see he doubles down into that simplicity, breaking down into shapes, right? This is where we talk about shapes and how these forms are created by black and white contrast, right? And uh, just wonderful, wonderful work how he, he's able to do this. If you haven't really studied Sin City, it's a great look at uh, contrast, form, shape, things like that. Okay, we're gonna go to the French real quick, or the Italian, the Europeans. Jean Girard, also known as Mobius, brilliant work. Uh, this is from Incal. His line quality, his ability to render things all with these line work is fabulous. He was also, I, I think he was really fast too in the way he drew. But these panels here, for instance, I love this panel. I love both of these panels and how they set up the dynamic angle, 
the simplicity of the sky and how there's the little details there on the, the figures and just the way they're positioned is just so cool. On the other side, I love also the texture. He's creating texture and tone values with these line marks. And then he changes the depth, the, the type of brush or marker he's using as you go down the, towards the bottom of the steps, you see how those marks are done with a different instrument. So he's changing like line variations within those lines to create that depth. And it's like, to me, that's like, that's what it's about, doing that kind of stuff, being able to pull that off, brilliant work. Okay, we've got two more minutes. Um, Inky Bial, amazing work. Again, someone you can find on um, in like those heavy metal issues. Just great imaginative work. There, here's a page of his stuff. Again, kind of like that Mobius, looking at all the detail, all those little lines he's putting in there, and the use of color too, and really using using that very um, small palette to kind of like create these different tones within that that small like subset of color. Very beautiful stuff. Milo Manera, again, wonderful work. Um, you know, worked with Fellini, you know, one of the best artists of our, of that generation. Love his stuff. You can find it out there. Humanoids has a lot of these European artists. So if you ever go to Humanoids booth at a con or go online, they have some of the Ameri the, some of the prints. Also Dark Horse, I think it was Dark Horse did like a collection of Maneras and things like that. So you can find those there. Um, He's known for feminine figure and brilliant stuff. Sergio Topi, one of my, another, I keep saying one of my top favorites. He's another top favorite. Um, design, look at just the design of these panels. It's just brilliant. You know, just texture, line, design, just there you go. Look at that. It's so freaking good. The silhouettes of the soldiers within the, the, the figure of the, there the soldier is just so freaking cool and the way he's able to pull that off and he's just using these he's using ink you know he's just using ink to, to draw that it's amazing simon beasley i love him we're almost out of time i could talk about him forever i loved his artwork and kind of the style like kind of this really cool balls to the wall kind of aggressive style he's like a frazetta with some like juice you know you put some like steroid juice in him and that's like him that's it's like out there but it's really well done will eisner you can't go wrong with will draftsman the different types of panels he's doing here is is brilliant uh mike mignola form you would say form shape right and it, the contrast of blacks his stuff looks brilliant black and white you don't even need to color it although here the coloring did a great job rizzo again another guy who using panels um, to show a scene right this all could have been done in one panel two panels but we use uh eight panels to really emphasize these moments and the way the figure is positioned in these different angles is really really cool so I like that. And we'll end with Jim Steranko, who is known for design, known for creating uh, beautiful pages with a symmetry and just kind of cool, exciting elements to it. I love the way the words are put in the shadows, and I love the way the panels get smaller and smaller as the action where this something happens. So it's beautiful stuff. There you go. We did it. Thank you so much. Any questions or thoughts? You can clap. I saw some people about You can clap. Anyway, that was a little fast, but that was what we had. Thank you so much for checking out. Again, I have the Art of Comics YouTube channel. I talk about this kind of stuff. I interview people, too. So um, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you.